got your Bibles along, you can open up to the sixth chapter of Matthew. If you'd like a Bible, raise your hand and somebody will get you one. Anybody that needs one. Follow along. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're at. Starting at verse 25, Matthew 6, verse 25, uh, you'll notice if you have a red letter Bible, where the red letters being where Jesus speaks, that we're in a big section of a lot of red letters. In fact, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, and it starts in chapter 5, and it goes through chapter 7. There's ushers here if you want a Bible. Just raise up your hand. We're in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in Matthew 6 at verse 25. Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more value than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we give thanks and praise. We give thanks for the gathering, the fellowship, the church, the way that you have created things to be, that we can encourage each other by our presence here, that we can together worship in one voice, in one faith, lifting up your name. And we give thanks, Father, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you promise wherever two or three are gathered, when we open up the word, it comes alive. And you are the potter, we're the clay, and so shape us, Lord. Make us. We ask for the Spirit to be moving in our hearts and minds this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Well, we're spending this year focusing on spiritual maturity, growing our faith, and hoping to help answer the question, what does it look like to live out the Christian life? We accept the truth that we're saved by grace through faith, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2. We might start asking the question, saved for what? What does living out my faith look like? And so to, to help us answer these questions as a way of growing and maturing, we have focused on the word gem, growing, expanding, and multiplying. And we've spent several weeks on growing personally, and we've transitioned to expanding our gifts and understanding of how those gifts can be used by God. And to help us understand how God calls us to expand, we've used spiritual disciplines, looking at various spiritual different di disciplines to empower us to live out our faith more intentionally to put into practice what we say we believe. And those spiritual disciplines are kind of broken up into three different categories, inward disciplines, outward disciplines, and then corporate disciplines, things that we would do together as the body of Christ. But we've done the inward stuff, and today we're moving to the outward disciplines, those that we can live out in our day-to-day -day life. The outward discipline that we're going to be diving into today is this, the discipline of simplicity. Anybody scared yet? Is there anybody here that, that's good at overthinking things? Anyone here good at making things way more complicated than they need to be? Hmm? In Facebook, I, I was been on Facebook, you know, from time to time, and um, looking at uh, rela the relationship portion, you can kind of do a little profile of yourself, and in there you can say your relationship status, you know, where you would say, like, married or single, and one of the buttons that you can push is, it's complicated. <laughs> right? I mean, we're really good at confused and complicated and overly complex and overthinking and overanalyzing. We get that in spades, don't we? And we do this in so many ways. One of the ways that we complicate our life is by piling up our closets and our sheds. 
by packing our schedules, by chasing after status or fame or popularity, life gets so complicated. We're good at adding stuff upon stuff until much of our time is occupied with taking care of our stuff or trying to decide what more we need to be the creme de la creme, the top of the pile, right? And when the reality of too much stuff starts to overtake our life, rather than move towards simplicity, what's the move that we make? Build a bigger shed. <laughs> Reorganize. Reshuffle. So we can have more stuff. But what about simplicity? Do you think that you might need to hear a message about simplicity this morning? Simplicity might seem like just way too easy of an answer for the complicated, overwhelming life that most of us lead. I mean, after all, if something is simple, right, we question it, we doubt it, we mock it. We say things like, it can't be that simple, there's got to be a catch. But the truth is, it's this. Simplicity is powerful. Simplicity is powerful. So here's the deal. <laughs> I don't want to overcomplicate the sermon on simplicity. <laughs> and I have a tendency. You know what I'm talking about. I don't want to overcomplicate it, so here's what we're going to do. This morning I'm going to do three things. I'm going to define what simplicity is. I want to talk about why it's important, and then I want to share how we can practice simplicity in our faith walk to draw us closer to one another and to God. Simple enough? Good. So what is simplicity? Simplicity is getting life down to the basics. It is uncluttering. It is a purposeful act of letting go of stuff and the drama that surrounds our worldly chaos that saps our energy. Simplicity is an ongoing activity where we train our mind and our heart to keep us from getting caught up in the things of this world. Simplicity separates us from the worldly values that get us stuck in a cycle of need and greed. Because in the world it's never enough, amen? Am I, am I the, again, here we go. Right? It's never enough. It's never enough. Simplicity brings joy and balance and peace. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 10. The Apostle Paul is writing here, Saul, who became Paul. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he says this, Philippians 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you didn't have an opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, the crux of what Paul is getting at in these short three verses are mentioned twice. He talks about being content. And at the heart of simplicity is the notion of being content. Anybody need some contentment in your life? To be content. And, and look at what Paul says. Because I think so often we, we, we kind of have this notion of simplicity. We're going to talk about it. it has, it's related to this. But so often it's about what we have, the outside stuff. But Paul says, I know what it is to have a ton of stuff. They have plenty. I know what it is to be in want. Paul talks about both ends of the spectrum. Both ends of the spectrum. And the answer isn't tons of stuff to protect yourself. And the answer isn't get rid of all your stuff. That's, the answer is what? I know how to be content. And it's this. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. 
The answer is God. Simplicity frees us. Writer Richard Foster puts it like this. He says, the lust for affluence in contemporary society is psychotic. It is psychotic because it has completely lost touch with reality. We crave things we neither need nor enjoy. We buy things we don't want to impress people we don't like. <laughs> and then he says this, conforming to a sick society is to be sick. Think about it. Conforming, just allowing ourselves to be swept along as society deems what's good and what we want, what we should have, to be conformed to a sick society is to simply be sick. When we live constantly craving, constantly unhappy, constantly overcomplicating our lives, the answer to the complication is more complication. Have you noticed? We live in that, and it's a spirit of restlessness. And behind that restlessness is a spirit of fear. That it's up to me, that i got to do it all, that it's not going to be enough. There's this deep-seated sense of restless fear gnawing at us. Contentment can be found in a life that practices simplicity. Because if we stop chasing after the next thing, we can turn and focus our heart on the only thing. So I want to break it down to its simplest form as we talk about what simplicity is. I want to as I've been thinking about it this week and looking at the texts, two things really came up that we can kind of wrap our brains around understanding simplicity, and they're this. The first thing is this. Simplicity, number one, it is freedom. It's freedom. Turn to Matthew chapter 6, where we started this morning, and look at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Or verse 27, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Worry, anxiety, it's all over that text from Matthew chapter 6, right? And Jesus answers, don't worry. We're really good at worrying and chasing and chaos and needy hunger. Simplicity is the physical act that says, I'm free. These things don't own me. I don't need them. Simplicity leads us out of worry, and we are freed from the burdens of keeping up with the Joneses. Simplicity is getting uncluttered, getting out from under the burden and the bondage of want. It is living in joy and simplicity of need. What do I really need? Now, what, what do I really need? And then in that freedom, right, when we see what we really need, we can see that God actually does provide. You see, because if we're constantly in this pattern of want and want and want and putting on stuff and piling stuff on, what we never end up really seeing is how God provides because we're so busy doing it ourselves. Amen? Amen? And so we never see the fullness of a God who says, I've got you. I've got you. In a world, we're going to always find scarcity. Out there, there is never enough. We will always want more. We will buy and we will eat, and we will pack away, and we will accumulate. But what we find in God, what we find in God is this, enough. We find enough that God provides and sustains. God said it to Paul, the Apostle Paul, you don't have to look at it now, but in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, 
Paul was struggling with a thorn in his flesh. And he said, God said to me, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And when we allow simplicity in our life, when we open up our hands, we can see God at work and we can see he's a provider and we can understand more fully that his grace is enough. We can look in scripture too for ways that God has provided and how it was enough. Turn to Exodus chapter 16. It's the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus chapter 16. And the title of this chapter is Manna and Quail. And where we're at in the story of God's people is that Moses and Aaron have led them people out of Israel. And they're now in the desert. And in verse 3, the people say to Moses and Aaron, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. They're struggling. I mean, talk about simplicity, right? They had been slaves, and if I'm correct, slaves don't have a lot to begin with, right? And then they fled Egypt with the Egyptian army hot on their tail, and I'm guessing that what they did is they started chucking things out the back of whatever they had so that they could get a little faster. So I'm thinking they hit the desert with not a lot and had pretty much a big need, and the big need was, we are hungry. We are starving out here. How is God going to provide? The, the whole chapter is called Quail and Manna because what God says is this, there's going to be quail in the evening and manna in the morning. And what God provides is a daily need. And this manna, every morning they come out and there's this flaky stuff all over the ground and God says, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, collect it. But don't try to save it for the next day. You know what happened when they tried to save it for the next day? Remember what happened? What did it do? It got all maggoty and smelly. They couldn't. It was just, if you tried to save it for a day longer, it was terrible. Except for the one day a week that God said, try and gather, gather two things because there's a Sabbath. And I don't want you to be working on the Sabbath. And it lasted for two days at that point. But you see, the point of the story is this. God provided. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. It was down to the basics. There was no hoarding. All you could do was gather what you needed for that day. Simplicity. What was needed was provided, and it came from God for his people. And the words that echo from that text into my heart as I read it is this. Don't worry about your life, what you are to eat or what you are to drink, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. My dad would have been 90 this year. Um, my parents grew up in the Depression. So I'm a child of the Depression, because I was taught to uh, hoard certain things. Anybody that I've ever known that had a parent or a grandparent that was around in the Depression, it affected them in certain ways. Now my mom, not some, my dad to a certain degree, but my mom more so, um, and it wasn't like she was a hoarder, but there were certain things, like tins. When we were, uh, my parents lived in their house for over 45 years, some 40 some years, and after my dad had passed away, we were moving my mom out, and we were down in the, in the, in the uh, utility room or the, um, the mechanical room where my mom and dad had storage, and there were these tins, you know, it was like, you know, big five-gallon tins with popcorn, you know, and it was like the Russian doll thing where it was like tin, 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 so you think it's one tin and you end up getting like 40 tins out of one tin, you know, and then there's all these tins. And so we, my sisters and I just started unpacking tins and putting them, and they were all over the basement. There were hundreds of tins. And we, had, we kind of gave this talk to my mom, like, okay, you know, the tin thing's got to stop. It's, this is not good. You're moving to an apartment, you know, you can take ten of them. Pick ten, because that's it. They're so good for cookies. Okay, but you can't only use that ten, you know? Uh, and, uh, and we go out for lunch, and we're sitting eating lunch, and we're having lunch, and, my, and we're, and we're, we're the, just, just my sisters and I, and my mom, after my dad passed. It was kind of sweet. We were sitting eating lunch. And my mom's like, oh, I've got cookies. I've got cookies for you. And I, I bought at the, at the, at the cosmo, cosmetic counter in Macy's. They had this thing where if you bought cosmetics, they'd give you these cookies in this wonderful tin. <laughs> and then she kind of looked at us, and my sisters and I looked at each other, and my sister said, put the tin down and step away. <laughs> put the tin down. See, you see, here's the deal. We... We have this sense that things aren't going to be enough, that it's up to us. 
That's up to us. See, hoarding is a bondage to the worldly values that bring fear and loss and anxiety that I don't have enough, that I won't have enough. And the more you hoard, the more certain you are that it won't fill it. It won't be enough. It is a vicious cycle of bondage. And so simplicity breaks that cycle, consciously walking away, letting go, and choosing less. Are you feeling trapped by your stuff? By your need or your greed? Then I invite you this morning into the freedom that comes from the spiritual discipline of simplicity. So the spiritual discipline of simplicity is first of all freedom. Second, it truly boils everything down to what is essential. It brings it all down to the heart of the matter, God. Matthew, first, Matthew 6, 31, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In a world that tells you all the things that you need to truly be happy, or to have in order to say that you've made it, isn't it good to hear this news this morning? That you don't need it? All you need, all you truly need, is the Lord. What you need has nothing to do with what you have or what you don't have. It has everything to do with the God who has you. John 10. John 10 tells us in no uncertain turn, Jesus says in John 10 verses 28 through 29, he says it twice, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hands. God has you. You can't get out of that grasp. And if God has you, what do you really need? I mean, really, what do you need? It's as simple as that. Simplicity is a disciplined lifestyle that acknowledges this truth. That there are lots of wants. The world is full of wants. And when we get caught up in all the wants and desires that we lose ourselves, there is only one need, Jesus. And when we acknowledge that, we discover and find ourselves. Amen. It's in him. As it says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can stand against us? So when we understand this, we can begin to live more simply because we know that God stands with us, that God loves us, that God provides for us, that we can be content. I know what it is to have plenty, and I know what it is to have want, and I've discovered the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So why would you choose to live out the spiritual discipline of simplicity? Well, I think as you discover what it is, freedom and a life lived in God, the answer of why should start to become clear as you think about it. But it's also a way that we can practice and live out our priorities. It's a way that we can show the world what's truly important to us as God's people. The spiritual discipline of simplicity requires us to differentiate between our needs and our wants. You know what I'm really good at? I'm really good at... Um, taking a want and thinking about it enough until it becomes a need. Anybody? <laughs> Obsessing over it until it's not a want to me, it's a need, but it really isn't a need. See, what simplicity does is it buffers us from lust and greed and gluttony because we open up our hands and we live like this rather than like this. Because this will never be enough. And God can't pour anything into this. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. A man came up to Jesus, Luke 12, 13. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me judge or an arbitrator between you? Then Jesus said to him, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Underline that if you need to. 
And he told them this parable. The ground, of a, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I'll store my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Drink, eat, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded from you. Then who will go get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with those whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Jump down to verse 32. Do not be afraid, Jesus says, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief can come near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, simplicity allows us to show where our heart actually is. And as we do that, we'll discover that our needs are met, that we have enough, and we'll find that we have more than enough, and that more can be put to use for God's kingdom rather than for the kingdom of me. The spiritual discipline of simplicity sets us free to share with others because we see that what we have is from God, and what we have can be used to bless others, for we are blessed to be a what? Blessing. Simplicity sets us free from the love of stuff and money and turns us towards loving God and our neighbors. So finally, how would we go about living more simply? How would we put this into practice? Well, I invite you to deliberately um, be satisfied with less. <laughs> you can start by giving away what you don't need, what you really need, and letting go of the stuff that you know is chaos and that you're chasing after that causes just nuttiness. I invite you to periodically reevaluate your life. Ask yourself the question, can I live more simply? As a way of assessing where you're at. Does your stuff own you or do you own it? It's a good question to ask. You might decide to limit your discretionary spending or to consider the ways that you spend your time and your money. But you see, this simplicity doesn't involve indulgence. It's about modesty and moderation. And most of us need to be reminded of that from time to time. Amen? So it's okay to enjoy the things that God has provided and enabled us to acquire. It's okay. This sermon is not, you know, that's bad. That, that's, not, that's not the deal. But desire and excess are all really strong seductions that we're all really susceptible to, right? And so this is a sermon that says simplicity can keep us humble and connected to Jesus by asking the right questions from time to time. By moving the chaos out of our life so that we have time for the Lord. Remember, simplicity doesn't mean we live in want. It means to learn to be satisfied and fulfilled by a simpler life, no matter what you have or what you don't have. It is about, as the Apostle Paul said, being content. So with simplicity, we demonstrate that we don't follow the world's order. It allows us to truly stand out as countercultural, a culture of faith and hope and love where Jesus lives in us and where Jesus lives through us. Simplicity. Every week as we're doing these sermon series about um, spiritual disciplines, we provide a, an insert in your, in, your, in your bulletin. And so there's a half-page insert in there on simplicity that we invite you to take home. And uh, um, I'm not even sure what, if on the other side of it is probably the prayer list. Um, but we invite you to take it home and to look at it. And if you look at it, I, I, what I didn't put on there is, what, you know, list down what you're going to get rid of. I didn't do that. That's, I mean, you, you think through your life. What I did do is think about, if you look at simplicity on that half sheet of paper, is to ask yourself, what gets in the way of your relationship to God and other people? That's what God wants you to work on. That's where we get overcomplicated and, and buggy. And so I invite you to take that, that half sheet of paper and, and, and work through that over the week and think about how living more simply might allow you to live closer to Jesus because he loves you and he
He wants everything out of the way that would keep you from him. Simplicity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for um, this, this gift of simplicity. We're thankful that um, our walk with you, that the Christian life is not some overly complicated thing. And we love to make it that. But truly, Lord, it's about you and, uh, you and me. It's about and how the two of us together step out into the world and affect the lives of people around me. For each of us, that's what it's about. It's simple. And so, Lord, help us unclutter our lives. Help us unclutter our thought process and our time so that we can be freed up to be filled. That we can have time with you and time with the people that are important and that we can reflect your love and grace in the lives of others. Father, draw us to a place of simplicity where we can hear your sweet call, your love and your grace, where we can see your provision and know you more and love you more, and praise you more. Simplicity. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people say,